Friends, Romans, countrymen. I know. Well, get on with it then. <laughs> By the mid-1960s, Kenneth Williams flared nostrils, elastic vocal cords, and distinct brand of comic hysteria had made him a unique performer. I'll get on to it right away. Nowhere more so than in the carry-on films. Put something on, you filthy beast. Oh, there's nothing to be afraid of. Oh, I don't know, though. Yes, it will hurt, Mr. Smith, and I want it to hurt. Perhaps next time you consider having a lump, you'll think twice about it. As the years went on, he dispensed with characters and co-stars. He didn't need scripts. He became his own material. Kenneth Williams was more on show than ever before. Naval display is Kenneth starting now. The finest naval display you would ever see is when I get out my navel. <laughs> they shoved me in this hospital. <laughs> they put a tube up the rear. <laughs> His act was an excavation of his own self, digging deeper into his own soul, brooding about his bowels. My bowels? And making us laugh. <laughs> OK now? Not really, no. I suffer very badly from wind. <laughs> he became a caricature of himself, I think. I'm very mean myself. <laughs> Burglar arm on the dustbin, I'm not... <laughs> the performance didn't end when the camera stopped rolling. All of William's life became an act. You saw this figure imprisoned in his own set of narrative tricks and his desire to show off and to amuse you and, and to reach you. You could see also that it was a performance and, a, in, in a deep sense, a desperate one. You're extremely well-read, extremely intelligent, and yet you are, in a sense, expected to behave all the time like some kind of outraged dowager, you know. He was hugely dissatisfied with the kind of person he was. And I think that was the problem. He didn't like himself. And I think that had he been acclaimed as the greatest Shakespeare actor since Burton, or, or had he made a career as a, as, a, as a sex symbol, there would still have been, he would still have been an unhappy man. I think that was, that was his, in his soul. <laughs> London in the mid-sixties was the place to be. The capital was swinging and change was in the air, but Kenneth Williams looked unlikely to play any part in it. Conservative of dress, lifestyle and habits, he seemed a fit step with the times. But his outer conformity hid a fascination with the new sexual freedoms of the age. It was swinging London, and Kenneth was always incredibly immaculately dressed. He was a very smart little chap. And he had a furled umbrella, I remember, and he was on the back of my lambretta on the pillion. We always used to sit rather straight on the pillion. <laughs> In those times, you could go round Eros. And for some reason, I thought, I'll go round Eros, so I felt a bit high. And Kenneth suddenly started shouting, waving this umbrella, saying, What? What? Where's it all happening? Where are all these orgies? Why haven't we been asked? William's wish to be part of the action was answered in 1964 when he met one of the most anarchic and flamboyant figures of the age, the playwright Joe Orton, who just caused outrage with his first West End hit, Entertaining Mr. Sloan. When I was with him in life, I found myself laughing so much of the time. It was terribly funny. I mean, often it was a very impish and outrageous kind of wit. Like Williams, Orton was gay, working class, and a prodigious diarist. Unlike Williams, Orton reveled in his sexuality. He lived with his long-term lover, Kenneth Halliwell, and sought sexual adventure at every opportunity. The freedom of his humor, the freedom of him, of himself, is what so appealed to Williams, who was so unfree in himself physically and intellectually. He was bound by convention and under wraps, and even if if Williams couldn't in himself be unabashed, he could be part of someone's story who was unabashed, and that was liberating. I remember one escapade in Leicester. He revisited Leicester and said that we couldn't go to my parents' house. 
So he took this bloke in instead to uh, the porch, which was the only part that remained of a derelict house. And he said that the sex, having sex in this porch, was peculiarly difficult because the circumstances were very confined. And he said, my bum was outside most of the time and it was freezing. But Orton wanted his friend to do more than take vicarious pleasure in his exploits. As his diary reveals, he urged Kenneth to shed his inhibitions and become more like him. I'm basically guilty about being homosexual, you see, he said. Then you shouldn't be, I said. Get yourself fucked if you want to. Get yourself anything you like. Reject all the values of society and enjoy sex. When you're dead, you'll regret not having fun with your genital organs. The friendship worked both ways. Orton was flattered by the attentions of a big star and loved his show business world. The Emma Andrew Show. With Kenneth's encouragement, he began to make guest appearances on TV game shows and chat shows. And tonight, Emma's guests are Bernard Braden, Barbara Kelly, Ava Gabor, Joe Orton, The Bachelors, Joe Orton. Welcome, Joe. Well, as I was saying, you're a very successful writer now, but what about this business of spending six months in jail? It's something to do with library books, hasn't it? Yes, I used to take lots of books out of the library, and I used to smuggle them out in a satchel, and uh, then I used to sort of paste a picture over the picture of the author. I remember one of them was by Lady Lewisham, a book on etiquette, actually, and I painted a picture of, or pasted a picture of, um, a great nude woman cut from a nude book. <laughs> People must have been very surprised. At heart, Williams and Orton were cut from the same cloth. I wasn't giving myself airs at all. I think. Both were highly intelligent and determined to prove themselves in the eyes of the world. Well, I didn't do it just on one book. I did it on hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> they always looked like two delinquent schoolboys to me. Both of them rejoicing in one another's schoolboy cleverness. And both needed success and didn't want unsuccess at any price. Orton was determined his new friend would star in his latest play, Loot, and cast him as the worldly and brutal Inspector Truscott. Williams was thrilled to be back on the stage in a work by the country's hottest new writer. But their first and only collaboration ended in disaster. The play died a death during its provincial tour and never made it to the West End. We were at Bournemouth and um, one usherette was reported as saying that it was unnecessarily filthy, as if there really was a necessary amount of filth. <laughs> <laughs> People were emptying the auditorium all the time, you know, with that production, because we came under the watch committee in Manchester, because we hadn't got the seal of the Lord Chamberlain, and we had policemen in the wings saying, if you show that line, if you show that line, the watch committee are banning that line, if you show that line, because the policemen had to say, where do you do it? Where the streets are well lit, there are no open spaces, where do you do it? Five pregnancies in one week, where have you done it? And the boy had to say, on crowded dance floors during the rumba. And they said it was a definite um, aspersion and rudeness about the local dance halls. The offence the play caused was not the only problem. The cast couldn't find a playing style that worked, and no one was struggling more than Kenneth Williams. Although Kenneth was in love with the play, it seemed to me, as we proceeded with the rehearsals, that he was wrongly cast. I saw it on its last night. I knew that it was meant to be a comedy, and it wasn't making anybody laugh. And Kenneth was, I don't know, I suppose he was just desperate. He was sort of, he was doing a send-up of something or other, but he was going into many different characters while he was supposedly playing this detective. After the show, I felt so suicidally depressed, I just don't know what to do. The utter shambles of this production is totally unbelievable. The cast is demoralised and the script practically in rags and some of it complete nonsense. I wish I'd never set foot near the rotten mess of it all. 